This meeting is now being recorded. Well, good evening. Welcome to our EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we introduce our speaker, I'd like to give an overview to our new attendees about our free program. So we're going to talk about who we are, uh, what is our program, some upcoming events, introduce our speaker for this evening, and then we'll go through a Q&A. So again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness Program based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, who's also on the call, leads the Cleveland, Ohio EDS Support Group. She was diagnosed with EDS in 2008, the same year my wife passed away with breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. We introduced our program of the 2012 EDNF conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We've started over 75 groups to date. Each group is given their own free website with a link from the directory and map. We received feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities that many cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We meet every first and third Tuesday, typically at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. All the programs are free. The meeting announcements, and whenever possible, the webinar recordings will be posted on our website at edsawareness.com for later replay. You can receive email announcements for future sessions by requesting the free report on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support Store, where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. The store is the only funding for this program, and it usually covers our monthly web fees. Please visit our store and check out the helpful products that we sell. Just a general disclaimer, this presentation contains general information about EDS. The members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in this program. The information is not advice. If you are having medical problems now, please call 911 and get the services that you need. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to your treatment. Just to let you know of some upcoming events, on Tuesday, June 16th, Dr. Hal Dietz will be presenting Connective Tissue Disorder Research. Dr. Dietz is the professor of pediatric cardiology, and a, he is a world um, authority on Marfan syndrome and other connective tissue disorders. Just to let you know, our future webinars will continue to be held on the first and third Tuesdays of each month at 7.30 p.m. Please go to the webinar tab at the top of the homepage on our website at edsawareness.com for more information. And a reminder that May has been EDS Awareness Month. Um, we're continuing to do more awareness activities, um, so please um, continue to schedule those and also participate in the EDS and Chiari walks, which are continuing uh, well into the month of June. Uh, just to let you know, EDS Awareness shirts are also still available at bodysupportstore.com for $10. For those attending live tonight, there will be an opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Please add your questions at any time by clicking the Q&A icon at the top of your screen. After typing in your question, click the orange button to submit. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Theo Haridis, and he is going to talk about mast cell disorders. He's the Director of Molecular Immunopharmacology and the Drug Discovery Laboratory and a professor of pharmacology, biochemistry, and internal medicine. 
and Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Tufts University in Boston. He has published over 350 research papers and three textbooks. He's been in the top 5% of authors most quoted in pharmacological and immunological journals. He has also received the Oliver Smith Award, recognizing excellence, compassion, and service while doing his training in internal medicine at the New England Medical Center. He received the Boston Mayor's Community Award and the Dr. George uh, Papa Nicali Award. And um, he has received all these degrees of honor, honors from Yale. And he's the founder and president of Autism Free Brain Incorporated, which is an organization committed to putting an end to autism by fighting, fighting brain immunity storms. So uh, just a little bit. He's uh, very accomplished and has done has done a lot of work, and we wanted to um, extend a warm welcome. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to go ahead and uh, load your slides, Doctor, and you'll see those on the screen now. And I'm going to go ahead and turn over the microphone to you. Thank you so much for speaking for us tonight. Thank you so very much for hosting me tonight. Um, I will be talking about uh, a series of disorders that are collectively known as mast cell disorders. But uh, even though they're rare, uh, as it will turn out, uh, they're actually much more common than we expected. And I would like to make some points uh, right at the beginning because it may be quite relevant to the audience. Uh, I will focus the presentation especially on neurologic symptoms, headaches, fatigue, and I'll mention pain, dysautonomia, and POTS, uh, symptoms that are common actually in EDS patients. And what is amazing is that even though EDS uh, prevalence might be in one about 3,000 people, and even though uh, mastocytosis, which is the most common of the mast cell disorders, has a prevalence of about one in about 2,000 people. A preliminary survey that was done actually by the Mastocytosis Society at my request uh, showed that about one in 10 people with mastocytosis also have EDS, which is quite phenomenal. Usually when we try to uh, find out what we call comorbidity, where the two diseases occur in the same individual, we multiply basically the fractions. So it technically it should be 1 over 3,000 times 1 over 2,000, uh, which is clearly um, very different from 1 in 10. So something is in fact uh, going on between these two otherwise rare diseases. I will also repeat a few slides at certain points uh, in order to make uh, some uh, key statements or at least uh, strengthen uh, those statements. So, uh, a few years ago, the Mastocytosis Society created a video and quite appropriately was called Mast Cell Activation Symptomatology, not mast cells, not allergies, which as I will tell you are quite uh, dependent on mast cells. And uh, the individuals actually that participated in the video, uh, Dr. Aiken, Castells, and Greenberger, are all now at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, except for myself, who still is at Tufts. Now, during the uh, Congress of the European Academy of Allergy and Immunology last year in Copenhagen, I had the chance to actually meet uh, two patients who had been sort of seeking me out for help. Uh, one was actually from the States, the other was from Copenhagen. And uh, during the course of the discussions, I kind of said, well, uh, you've been telling me you've uh, spent about uh, between 7 and, and 15 years and somewhere in the range of about 20 physicians before a diagnosis was made. Why don't we just make a documentary and you tell basically your stories and I'll try to fill in a lot of the information that I will be telling you today. So right uh, then and there, within a day, we created a documentary that you can find on YouTube, and it's called My Mystery Symptoms and Mast Cells. And I think you'll find it quite useful because a lot of the symptoms that these patients present with uh, may be quite familiar to a number of you. And some of you may have also, as we heard earlier, 
uh, have gone through many years without an appropriate diagnosis. Now, some general principles about any disease, uh, and I, I want to strengthen <coughs> uh, this uh, area because it goes really unnoticed by many of my colleagues as well. Um, sometimes we tend to lump everything under one disease because we've suffered so much, we've gone for so many years without a diagnosis. But it's very important that we do exclude other diagnoses because often, as I'm sure you know, there might be comorbid or co-current diseases. So one might have, let's say, EDS and might have fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. The same holds true for mastocytosis as well. So it's important to identify the comorbidities because sometimes the comorbidities may be more manageable than the primary diagnosis itself. It's also quite important to prioritize the symptoms. I get actually uh, all kinds of females with desperate um, requests for help, as you might imagine, but then I get like a two-liner. And, you know, with patients uh, like the ones that you will hear about as well as those with EDS, there can be so many different symptoms. And unless we actually focus on the symptoms that make your life worse right now or their life worse, it will be very difficult to actually address all of them at one point at the same time. In certain cases, there might be triggers, especially in mastocytosis patients, and those have been <coughs> critical to be removed. Sometimes it might be foods, additives. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about treatment approaches uh, uh, even though clearly, you know, you're not um, most likely a mastocytosis patient uh, yourself, and therefore some of these uh, might not be as relevant, but I will go through them in order to actually uh, make a point towards the end. Now, even though we talk about allergies, I, the, the whole field is very confusing, and I want to indicate the different terms in medicine identify different things, and they're not all basically the same. So we talk about allergies, but sometimes with allergies, you've got edema or swelling in your skin, which goes with the territory, so to speak. We call that hives sometimes. But there's another disease called edema or angioneurotic edema, which will be very different and diagnosed very differently and treated very differently. We talk about asthma, but half of the asthma is allergic and half is not. We talk about atopic dermatitis, otherwise called eczema. Again, about half of it is allergic, half is not. We talk about food allergy, but we talk about food intolerance. So in food allergy, as in allergic diseases, you're truly allergic, and I'll explain what that means shortly, to something. We call that something antigen or allergen. But in certain cases, all the tests are negative, yet you have all the symptoms of quote-unquote allergy. When that relates to foods, we tend to call that food intolerance or sensitivity. But then we have sensitivities to ingredients within foods to which we're not allergic, like for instance histamine, and I'll talk about histamine later. And then we've got itching. And when we don't know where the itching comes from, we call it idiopathic. Then we have specific diagnosis, like mastocytosis, that I'll go over. But now as of a few years ago, there is a variant of that so in mastocytosis, you have a lot of mast cells. Most of the time, they're activated, and I will indicate what that means. But now we have a variant where you do not have an increased number of mast cells, but the mast cells that you have, even though the numbers may be normal, are activated. And we don't have any objective tests for that, which makes life even more complicated. And then we have things like non-IG food allergy. What, what on earth is that? So you might be... Uh, responding to foods, especially after uh, they've been uh, recooked uh, or sat around a while. It's like wine getting fermented. So once the food starts kind of allowing the bacteria that are there anyhow to start sort of growing, before you get actually to a food poisoning, that food might actually, you know, bother you. Uh, as of recent, there is a new allergy it's non-IgE allergy, and I'll explain what IgE is, uh, against uh, a polysaccharide, a component of the proteins inside meat, but only from mammals, and that is called alpha-gal allergy because that is what that ingredient is called, and we didn't know about it until a few years ago. 
And then you have rhinitis, as you see in the picture somewhere about to sneeze, but one third of it is only allergic. Uh, the other is called perennial, and in fact the nervous system seems to play a major role in that as well as in some of the other conditions. And even though this slide is, is very hard to read, small letters, the point I want to make is that there are a number of diseases that, that mimic mast cell disorders. So you can imagine how complicated it becomes if a patient presents with symptoms involving every organ of the body, uh, and therefore there can be all kinds of other diseases relating to those organs. And most of the time, the allergist will just say, basically, you know, it's on your mind and um, send someone away. In fact, that scenario is quite common. Uh, be it as it may, it's important to at least make sure that some other bona fide diagnoses, as I said earlier, are excluded because they might be treatable, while mastocytosis, as with EDS, is hard to treat, uh, or at least uh, treat effectively uh, uh, for the present. So if I were to sort of summarize so far, uh, I wrote an editorial a few years ago, and uh, the title was Atopic Conditions in Search of Pathogenesis and Therapy. Well, what is atopic conditions? So when we don't understand something in medicine, we give it another name. So atopic means that you have a propensity or you're likely or you're sensitive uh, to potentially getting an allergic reaction, but you're not really allergic. And in fact, there are many individuals, as we will talk about later, that may develop symptoms consistent uh, with allergy, but they don't have a true allergy, or they might have sensitivity to chemicals, odors, to which we're not allergic. So we kind of lump all of that under the term atopy. And mast cells, as you will see shortly, have been involved or are known to be involved in the development of allergic reactions, but we're finding more and more that they're actually involved in many other diseases, as you see in the daisy there, such as food intolerance, interstitial cystitis, which is a sterile bladder disorder, a very common, one in 100 women has it, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. For the last few years, we've been actually studying the role of these cells in autism. And then as you go left to where you see mast cell activation syndrome and at the very top multiple chemical sensitivity syndrome, where these individuals are literally sensitive to everything, drugs, foods, environmental uh, exposures, etc., and we have no way of treating them. But by at least putting the mast cell at the center, we have a hypothesis which is testable, and then potentially if we can actually block the mast cell, as I will tell you towards the end, we might be able to help these patients as well. Now, what is mastocytosis? I'm not going to go through this algorithm uh, right now, other than say that about uh, uh, five, five years ago or so, uh, it became apparent that these cells uh, can release numerous molecules, we call them mediators, not necessarily all of them at the same time. And I'll make two points with this slide. Imagine that a mast cell, as you will see again shortly, is like a soccer ball filled with about 500 ping pong balls. Uh, each ping pong ball having about 30 or so uh, little marbles. If you are truly allergic, this cell will explode like a hand grenade and release all its molecules in the granules. And in addition, over about 24 hours, it will synthesize another 30 or so molecules, which will be released shortly. So the immediate response we call the immediate reaction, and the late response we call it a late re reaction. However, we were among the first, if not the first, to show that the mast cells may release molecules without ever exploding, which we call degranulation. So for many years, we were missing the forest for the trees because we were looking for the mast cell to degranulate, and it wasn't. And in fact, in many of the comorbid conditions that I mentioned already, such as chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, interstitial cystitis, autism, the mast cells do not appear to degranulate, yet they release mediators. So one point with this slide is, if the mast cells release a molecule called tryptase, which is an enzyme, it's like a meat tenderizer, 
which is plentiful inside its granules, then if it is elevated, that's a telltale sign that one may have systemic mastocytosis. If you look at the right-hand side, if there's tryptase barely elevated, but you have all kind of lesions on your skin, uh, as you will see later, many of these look like moles, uh, but they're actually very different and they each when you scratch them, then you can biopsy the skin and you end up with what is called cutaneous mastocytosis. And if you look at the box towards uh, the bottom uh, right hand side, you see molecules such as methylhistamine, PGD2, prostaglandin F2-alpha. These are breakdown products of some of the molecules released from the mast cell, but they're broken down so quickly that the only time you can effectively measure them, it's actually in urine that we collect for 24 hours. Otherwise, we miss them. And those, many times, are released without the mast cell exploding. So, as you can see, there may be ways to look for a severe systemic mastocytosis, a somewhat milder cutaneous or skin mastocytosis, or for the breakdown products in the urine that, if they're elevated, suggest mast cell activation without necessarily having the full-blown systemic disease. If, in fact, the tryptase is very high and we suspect that someone has mastocytosis, you have to do bone marrow biopsy, and, in fact, you have to do two bone marrow biopsies, usually done on the pelvic bone. And, as you can see, there are two clusters uh, on panel A stained with uh, one particular molecule and two clusters, actually the same clusters almost, stained with a different molecule. So if you get actually, so each cluster is about 50 or so mast cells. This shouldn't be like this in the bone marrow. So if you get clusters and they're stainable either with tryptase in one panel or a particular what is called a receptor on the surface of the cells that allows them to bind a growth uh, factor and grow, and then you have a diagnosis of mastocytosis. In contrast, if you look at panel C, you see those red, uh, mole-looking spots on this particular patient. She has sy <coughs> not systemic mastocytosis, but cutaneous mastocytosis, and if you scratch those, they will itch like crazy, and they might actually uh, stay as they are, or they might actually grow uh, even more, especially under stress, and I will indicate that uh, later. As I indicated, however, recently uh, we came up with a different diagnosis of what is called mast cell activation syndrome. What is important with this diagnosis is not only that it does not depend on objective criteria, except for the possibility that some of those molecules might be increased in urine. But as you can see in the blue rectangle, it is accompanied by neurologic complaints. Until now, no one really believed that these patients have neurologic issues that relate to the disease. Something that I think may be true for EDS as well, who we have quite a few actually neurologic problems, and now there are a couple of papers published indicating that, but until recently, at least the patients that I had the chance uh, to uh, examine and, and talk to uh, were told basically that any neurologic problem was all in their minds. And you can see at the lower panel a publication specifically talking about neurologic symptoms in adults with mast cell diseases. Now, if we were to look at this um, panel, and this panel with some changes is going to appear uh, in July in a review that I've written in the New England Journal of Medicine that is entitled Mast Cells, coma, Mastocytosis, coma, and Related Disorders. So if you see the center of it, that's actually an electron micrograph of a real mast cell magnified about 3,000 diameters. The gray area in the middle is the nucleus where all the sort of genetic information is. And you appreciate how many of those granules, we call them, secretory granules, those little secretory sacs, all those kind of dark 
spots inside the cell. There are about 500 of those in each cell. And as I said, each one of those contains about 30 to 50 uh, molecules. And then the cell makes another 30 to 50 molecules. So it's literally a powerhouse of biologically active molecules. And the mast cell, in addition to being activated by allergens, which is shown at the top red oval, and this is what we've known for the longest time and have been teaching, we know it's activated by drugs, by various peptides released from nerves, by cytokines released from other immune cells, from toxins to the environment, from bacteria, fungi, viruses, and I will talk about mold a little later as well. And depending what molecules are released, they will actually affect different tissues or organs of the body, and you're going to have actually different symptoms. So you can imagine if a patient with all these symptoms were to show up at the door of a physician, they'll think they're crazy because they have so many symptoms, and the physicians, unfortunately, will think that this is absolutely impossible. Uh, hopefully, after the review is published in the New England Journal of Medicine, this panel uh, is seen by physicians, they'll think hopefully twice about telling patients it's all in their minds. So what were we teaching until now uh, was that immunoglobulin E or IgE, which is made when we're exposed to an allergen, whether it's food, environmental, etc., sits actually in specialized areas on the surface of the cell, showing on the lo lower right-hand side. And if the allergen uh, is exposed again to these Ig antibodies, it bridges them and leads to a whole bunch of reactions that we don't quite understand yet, leading eventually to what you see at the left-hand side where the content of a granule is about to come out, and that's what we call degranulation. That's kind of the explosion of the cell. But the cell doesn't die, and in about 24 hours, at least in the laboratory, is ready to fire again. But if you look at the left-hand side arrow, we were the first to show that the cell can release molecules that are involved in inflammation, and I'll explain that a little later, without necessarily ever degranulating. So if we were to look at an actual mast cell, uh, the top panel shows two mast cells. This is like three-dimensional optics. It's called Nomarski optics. You can see an indentation, which is the nucleus, and you can see how many granules fill up the cells all the way to the rim. The remaining few cells around it, and this is taken from the peritoneal cavity of a rat, are lymphocytes or white blood cells. If we were to present to these cells a molecule released from neurons or nerve cells called the substance P, the cell, as you will see to the, at the bottom, literally explodes like a hand grenade, but the other immune cells are actually unaffected. And what we're shown at the left-hand side is in addition to the allergen and Ig shown in sort of red there, there are all kinds of different triggers. We'll talk about the triggers uh, more a little later. And the right-hand side, in addition to histamine, which is at the very top, which is the best known molecule released from mast cells, that's why we give antihistamines, which block the action of histamine after it's been released. We have meat tenderizers like tryptase, and then we have a whole bunch of other molecules that can sensitize nerves, cause pain, cause edema, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In fact, uh, we can even group the various triggers of the mast cell in various drugs that you can see on the right-hand side that include actually estrogens, peptides released from the nerves shown to the right-hand side, all kind of immune cells released from uh, white blood cells shown to the lower left, and then environmental triggers such as bacteria, fungi, and heavy metals such as uh, mercury, uh, etc. So clearly, this mast cell can respond to very, very many uh, different uh, triggers. And except for the allergens, all the other triggers do not quali qualify as an allergic response. So if someone, therefore, has symptoms that are reminiscent of allergies but is not allergic, he or she may be responding to any one of these triggers and many more that I did not actually include in this slide. And with this slide, I just want to make a point that the mast cells do not just sit there by themselves. They can talk to other white blood cells called T cells to the right that are involved in parasitic and viral infections. 
and they can talk to the cells at the left called macrophages that are the scavengers that basically eat up all kinds of things. And they can respond to bacteria releasing molecules which then trigger what we call inflammation. Now, what is inflammation? If you had actually a splinter in your finger, you might get pus. Pus are white blood cells that are there to get rid of the splinter. If they cannot, however, you might get an abscess. So inflammation is protective to a certain extent, and it can become very destructive uh, if actually uh, it goes overboard. And in fact, in many conditions, including mastocytosis, it does go overboard. Now, what is interesting is the mast cell, if you write, see the right-hand side panel, was discovered by Dr. Paul Ehrlich in 1887. He was just staining tissues, and one of his uh, tissues was stained with a blue dye that turned out violet when it actually uh, bound to the cells. And he identified those as mast cells because in German, mast cells mean sort of well-fed cell. And, uh, of course, from the Greek, uh, mast comes from the word breast, like uh, mammogram, for instance. Or <clears throat> and that he thought that these cells were feeding other cells. As it turned out, he wasn't right at all, but the name actually stuck. At about the same time in 1991, an experiment was being performed from the Oceanographic Museum at the Principality of Monaco in the southern part of France, where two scientists, uh, <coughs> Olivier Richet, uh, had decided to take actually tentacles from jellyfish because it was quite um, prevalent in the area and it was kind of stinging a lot of people. And they thought if we grind up the tentacles and we inject them into dogs, the dogs will become immune to farther stings. And they had a word ready for it. We we're going to call it prophylaxis or protection. Well, that's not what happened. When they actually injected uh, that extract into dogs and they exposed the dogs to the jellyfish again, they actually could not breathe. They dropped the blood pressure and died. And they called that anaphylaxis. In fact, mast cells are absolutely mandatory for the development of anaphylaxis, which is the extreme of all allergic reactions. So if we were to look at the mast cell at about 5,000 times magnification with electron microscopy, you see an intact mast cell at the left-hand side, panel A. And if you look at panel C, that's scanning electron micrograph. So you can see basically the surface of the cell. You almost see actually the little bumps, which are the granules. Now, panel B, the cell has been activated, and you can see some of the granules now have lost their density, and they look like salt and pepper. And if you look at panel D, you see many of the granules are showing up at the surface now as they're actually releasing their content. That happens within five minutes or so. So as a summary, there's no question now that the mast cells are involved not only in allergy, but in inflammation. And if you look at the right-hand side panel, of that panel, if you look at the left, the cell literally degranulates. You can see most of the granules have lost their content. That's what happens in allergy and in anaphylaxis. But if you look at the right-hand side panel, you see that the granules have changed their appearance, but within the cell. They have not actually uh, expelled their content. And that's what happens when they release molecules selectively without undergoing this explosive release. And that's where we've missed, basically, their participation for many years, because we couldn't quite see it with light microscopy. So going back to the definition, what is important to remember is that mast cell numbers may define mastocytosis, but it is the activation that really causes the problems for the patients. In other words, in 99% of the cases, you might have a lot of mast cells, but those are not going to actually make your life miserable. It is the activation of the mast cells by so many triggers that will do that. And I will try to explain to you why such patients get neurologic symptoms. And I'll preempt that by saying that mast cells are found in the brain in the most critical area that actually regulates emotions, and the brain never gets allergic reactions. So go figure. So obviously they're doing something else there than just allergies. Now, the Mastocytosis Society published recently uh, a survey of various symptoms. And as you can see, 
95% of the people describe that they have brain fog. In fact, many EDS patients have told me that they also have brain fog. Uh, we can define brain fog as reduced attention span, cognition, memory, ability to multitask, processing, you know, word finding, all of the above. And I've, I've had actually patients who were professional health providers, to give you an example, and they literally had to quit their jobs because of brain fog, and I'll tell you how we literally can lift the brain fog towards the end. What is very interesting comes from epidemiological studies published uh, recently where you can read allergic diseases in preschoolers are associated with psychological and behavioral problems. And in fact, atopic eczema is associated with ADHD. Many such studies now are changing our whole paradigm of what happens to the body when you have allergic-like problems. Clearly, they affect uh, the brain and behavior. And here are neuropsychological features in mastocytosis patients and problems with cognition in mastocytosis patients. Again, these symptoms were not even believable until some years ago. Well, to introduce uh, the next sort of, you know, 10 slides or so, I really believe that the mast cells serve like the canary in the mind of the body. They respond to practically everything, aluminum, antibiotics, drugs, estrogens, mercury, mold, PBCs, etc. So obviously, the mast cell must have been very helpful to the body at some point, and as we kind of evolved, it probably went by the wayside, and now it's kind of getting... Uh, uh, very involved again as we pollute our environment, change our uh, diet habits, and what have you. And to give you an example, uh, and I will, I will return to such examples later, we don't necessarily have to be allergic or intolerant or sensitive to crazy things. Here is a paper showing that many foods contain salicylate. Salicylate is basically aspirin. Aspirin is acetyl salicylate, and the acetyl group was added by the firm Bayer, so it doesn't actually corrode your uh, stomach, even though, as we know, we still get gastritis from taking aspirin such products. But you can see nectarine, asparagus, cumin, you know, tomatoes, paprika, contain a lot of salicylates. So patients might actually get both allergic-like symptoms as well as neuropsychiatric symptoms by just basically eating foods that contain salicylates to which uh, they are not uh, tolerant and they don't know about it. Um, and uh, here are a couple of studies showing again that atopic diseases are associated either with attention deficit hypersensitivity or in the lower panel, uh, this case was kids were actually exposed to mold in Poland and they literally presented with symptoms uh, consistent with autism. And I've been fascinated over the last year and a half of how many patients I've seen who even though test negative to mold, they respond violently with both physical and, and emotional and neuropsychiatric problems to mold, primarily because mold releases basically toxins that are airborne. They're called mycotoxins. So even though the mold might be visible in your bathtub, for instance, and you might have cleaned it, you might have released mycotoxins that uh, stick around actually bound to carpets, to drapes, etc., and you might actually be breathing them for a very long time. Now, where are the mast cells in the brain? Uh, at the left-hand side, you see about half of a blood vessel, and you can see the mast cell, in this case, it's not round, but stretches around, hugging the blood vessel. On the right-hand side panel, the right-hand side of that blue panel, you can see a cross-section of a blood vessel with a red blood cell in the middle, uh, the endothelial cells are making up basically the wall, and then right around it you see a mast cell hugging it again. So the muscles are very critically located around blood vessels, and in fact some years back the picture that you saw uh, decorated the cover of a journal called Brain Research Reviews, where we spoke about the role of mast cells in migraines, and many mastocytosis patients, and I know many EDS patients, have actually headaches and migraines, so they might be quite relevant. And here are some papers talking about mast cells being involved uh, in pain, especially uh, in the brain, uh, and you know we can talk about that later if you have any questions. Um, 
we actually showed that the mast cells talk to nerves and vice versa. If you look at the right-hand side, the middle uh, panel, uh, the sort of vertical uh, blue line is a blood vessel. Uh, the weakly, almost horizontal line is a nerve. And you can see the blue cell with a kind of white circle, which is the nucleus, sitting right onto uh, the nerve. So we've shown in this paper another that the mast cells basically communicate with nerves, uh, again, and vice versa. So uh, a lot of things that will happen uh, in the brain and in the periphery with sensory nerves will affect the mast cells. And here are some papers talking of mast cells uh, affecting the mind or mast cells affecting the brain. So even though we had published that in two, uh, two, 20 years ago, uh, numerous papers now are basically expanding on this. Let me uh, talk a little bit about histamine. As I said, histamine is the most well-known molecule released from mast cells. And as I said, we may be sensitive to histamine in the foods, and processing the foods actually creates a lot of histamine, especially if you let it sit around. So many mastocytosis patients do very well with uh, fresh uh, meats, for instance, or other foods cooked. Uh, but if they freeze them and then thawing them or let them around in the refrigerator, they respond actually quite badly. Uh, there are also bacteria that can make histamine. Such bacteria are found sometimes in uncooked fish, especially cod. Uh, it's not, again, food poisoning, uh, but it can cause a lot of problems in especially mastocytosis patients. And we call that sometimes histamine uh, intolerance. And here is a set of foods that contain a lot of histamine. Uh, fish do, sauerkraut, spinach does, you know, cheeses do, etc., etc. Same idea with salicylates. Uh, many patients cannot tolerate uh, a whole bunch of foods. And I won't actually go through this table because it's fairly complicated. Suffice it to say, the histamine is not necessarily bad. It's very important in the brain for motivation and memory. So when these patients take antihistamines, to reduce many of the symptoms, and they do take them quite appropriately. They many times overdo it of how much antihistamines they take, and eventually they lose motivation, and they, that might contribute actually to the brain fog as well. So uh, too much of one thing is not necessarily good. Now, what are the triggers for these patients? Again, from the same survey, you see the stress uh, was considered uh, one of the top, in addition to heat, triggers. And in fact, there are many papers, and I will give you some of our own data, talking about brain mast cells being involved uh, in anxiety. In fact, many diseases are worsened uh, by stress, such as, of course, allergies, autism, bipolar disorder, fibromyalgia, everything we've spoken to pretty much today. And we wrote a review about stress and multiple sclerosis and another review of stress and psoriasis. The question is, how does that happen? Because until now, uh, everybody thought, well, it's just in your brain, basically. Just take it easy. That's not exactly true. Here's an example of uh, a mother that had major uh, stressful events, actually many mothers, and they showed that the cord blood had high IgE. So just severe stress during gestation was enough to increase IgE let alone non-IG triggering that we will talk about shortly. And in another paper, this was in, in mice, they showed that if you remove the pup from the mom, it's called maternal separation or deprivation stress, in this case rats, it created actually contacts between mast cells and nerves in the gut, and the animals developed uh, symptoms consistent with like irritable bowel syndrome. Now, we hypothesized that the mast cells may be triggered under stress by the first hormone released under stress called corticotropin releasing hormone, abbreviated sometimes CRH and sometimes CRF, as you can see in the lower panel. And here is a publication from us at the top and a separate publication from other colleagues at the bottom that basically CRH triggers the mast cells. It either makes the blood-brain barrier that protects the brain permeable, or it makes the gut intestinal epithelial barrier permeable. That means that bad substances or toxins from the gut can enter the circulation and eventually enter the brain and cause inflammation in the brain. 
And in fact, in a journal called Clinical Therapeutics, tomorrow there will be a series of articles for which I was the editor talking about the gut bacteria and how they influence both the immune system and the brain. So we hypothesized that if there is actually stressors of any kind, it can be infection, it can be sun uh, <clears throat> stroke, uh, it can be high fever, basically we release CRH and along with other uh, peptides, one is called neurotensin, the other called substance P within the box on the right hand side, it will trigger the mast cell shown in, <clears throat> in green, they will basically make the blood brain barrier leaky and other molecules will come in and set up inflammation either in the brain, the skin, or the gut, and it will basically lead to the mastocytosis symptoms. So how do we study that? You take a mouse, you inject actually a, a molecule called technetium gluceptate in the tail vein, which cannot escape the circulation. You put it into a plexiglass immobilizer, and you think that the mice like little places. They hate it. And then you sacrifice them in about 30 minutes, and you look at the brain, shown with a red circle there, and you see how much of this technetium has left uh, the blood vessels that got into the brain. And if you look at the panel at the right lower side, you see that what is called plus plus are normal mice, and the bar shows that a lot of this material has left the circulation and gone into the brain. However, if we were to repeat this experiment in animals that genetically do not have any mast cells, called WW, nothing happens. So the stress leading to opening of the blood-brain barrier and inflammation of the brain, at least in mice, is entirely dependent on mast cells being activated by this hormone CRH. And if you do a different type of experiment, you can inject a blue dye in the tail vein and then inject in the skin while the animal is alive but anesthetized or doesn't feel anything, the trigger, in this case CRH, then you kill the animal, remove the skin, I know it sounds gross, turn it over, and you see wherever the blood vessels became leaky, you get a blue uh, spot. And as you can see, you get blue spots when we inject the actual stress hormone. If you were to do that again in animals that do not have any mast cells, as the right uh, lower hand side, nothing happens. So clearly the mast cells respond to this stress hormone and then lead to inflammation. And we can look for what happens by using isolated cultured mast cells that we get from umbilical cord blood. And if in fact the mast cells were to respond to CRH, they should have specialized areas on their surface called receptors to which this hormone will bind and trigger the cells. And as you can see in this publication, if you look at the middle of the lower panels, each one of those uh, six cells lights up like a light bulb when we use an antibody bound to fluorescein to identify the receptors on the surface. So there's no question anymore that the cells actually respond to a stress hormone, and therefore it's not all in your mind. And we've written many reviews about how mast cells respond basically uh, to CRH and what happens after that. And things get even more complicated without going into the details. Another molecule released from nerves called substance P can make the muscles grow even more receptors for CRH, therefore respond even more to CRH. And in fact, mastocytosis patients have a lot of this substance P in their blood as was published in the lower hand side panel. So you get a cyclic reaction. Uh, you get stress releasing CRH, CRH then releases substance P, substance P makes the CRH receptors grow on the mast cells, mast cells respond more to CRH, so forth and so on. So you can imagine how important it is to block the mast cells from firing altogether rather than dealing with histamine after it's been released. And I will skip this. Basically it says that the mast cells have uh, interactions between various receptors and the story gets even more complicated. But you might ask, well, all of this is good, but how about actual patients? Can you show me that something happens to patients? Here is a patient that I showed you actually the picture much earlier of her back. Uh, she had actually only a few of those spots. She had actually cutaneous mastocytosis. But uh, she underwent actually, uh, from what she described, uh, a very, very, very complicated and sudden divorce. Within actually a week, she was covered with spots. Clearly the stress affected uh, her appearance due to these collections of muscle growing. 
And when we looked actually for the receptor for CRF or CRH uh, on the right-hand side panel, we saw a lot of those cells were now turning uh, black because we were using a black dye to identify the presence of the receptors. And in another case, uh, this patient, who has since become actually my clinical assistant, uh, she was always responding to stress. In fact, her skin was very sensitive. You can see the round areas on her chest, on your torso. That's where we had placed basically the stickies to do an electrocardiogram. And you can see basically the uh, impression of uh, the sticky areas two days after actually the EKG was done. In this case, we took uh, her bone marrow biopsy, and you can see collection of those brown mast cells in your bone marrow, but when we stained those for the CRH receptor showing the little red rectangle at the right-hand side, the mast cells, again, lit up because they had many, many CRH receptors, and in fact, CRH was very high in her blood. So CRH released under stress were binding to your cells, turning basically the mast cells on and creating the numerous symptoms uh, that she had. So you can see that there are now reviews talking about a brain-skin connection, the same way we can talk about brain-gut connection uh, with CRH under stress affecting the mast cells. Let me skip this slide. Uh, except to say that in the brain, microglia are the white blood cells of the brain, and the microglia talk to the mast cells. And I'll just give you just a few slides relating to autism just to make a point that in autism, uh, until now it was considered a psychiatric disease, but uh, we've shown, and so did others, that the microglia talk to the mast cells and the cause brain inflammation. And in fact, what is released from these cells is, let me skip this, the mitochondria are the organelles inside the cells that make energy. We were the first to show, here is the, you see the nucleus, the dark areas, the nucleus, all the brown goldy stuff are the mitochondria. We showed that when the mast cells were activated, the mitochondria were broken down and moving actually to the surface. You can see on the right upper hand side panel, now the whole cell is filled up. You can't see the nucleus anymore. And when we measured actually what happens, each one of those bars on the left hand side is actually material coming from mitochondria in the fluid bathing basically the cells that we're culturing. So when we're activating the cells, the mitochondria that were only supposed to make energy are spitting out their content outside. Now that's important to go back to slides because Dr. Margulis, who unfortunately died in 2011, was the first that said that the mitochondria that make energy were actually bacteria that became symbiotic with our cells millions of years ago. So when the body sees uh, this material coming out of the mitochondria, thinks that it has actually an infection because there were bacteria that never leave the cell, it mounts a massive inflammatory response. And you can see at the bottom uh, part that mitochondria DNA can actually damage neurons in the brain. And mitochondria uh, DNA is very different than the DNA with, uh, in our nucleus because, as I said, it comes from bacteria, so we can easily identify it. So in addition to histamine and other molecules that I told you earlier uh, can be released from the mast cells, uh, now we know that many more molecules can be released. That's why they participate in inflammation. So the mast cell, as a summary, can release by degranulating and spitting out histamine and this meat tenderizing cryptase. They can release mitochondrial DNA that is misconstrued as an infection and can release without degranulation other molecules. But what is fascinating, you look at the right lower hand side panel, is that any time some mast cells release their content, as you can see with the dark spots, but some cells, as you see at the upper part of that panel, do not. So we've been trying for years to identify why certain cells respond and others do, because if we do identify how that happens, then clearly we can come up with a way to block the mast cells and treat many of these diseases. There are a number of drugs that are used, I'm not going to go through them, uh, for mastocytosis patients. Suffice it to say, they all just touch the surface. They deal with the symptoms, some to a better, some to a lesser extent, but not with the pathogenesis of the disease. One important thing, because EDS patients also 
uh, have sometimes problems with sleep. There are a number of drugs that can be used to help with sleep. If there are some questions, I can go over them. Some are antidepressants like amitriptyline, others like benzodiazepines, other antihistamines, and melatonin is a hormone released from our own pineal gland that sets the biological clock in our brain. Now pain, again, many of these patients have severe pain because they have osteoporosis, osteopenia, and many DS patients have pain as well. Again, I can go over this if there's some questions. Some of the old tricyclic antidepressants such as Elevil are quite good for chronic pain. They all have their own side effects. Um, gabapentin uh, uh, is a, more like an anti-seizure drug. It sort of calms the nerves so they don't fire as much. Same thing with pregabalin or diagabin. Tramadol is like an opioid. It's like morphine, but it's not addictive and it does not have the side effects like constipation that morphine has. So I kind of like tramadol you know, quite a bit, at least for short term. And then even though we talk about antihistamines, they have their own actually actions. Some of them may be quite useful in patients that might have dysautonomia or POTS. So some of them, for instance, like cyproheptadine, is not only antihistamine, but it's anti-serotonin. Serotonin is involved in migraines. So cyproheptadine is my most popular safe drug, actually, for migraine headaches, you know, before you try any, uh, you know, a different or heavy-duty uh, drug. Uh, and then I, I need to indicate that some antihistamines belong to what are called phenothiazines. At the very bottom, phenothiazines are used, actually, for psychosis or schizophrenia. And they have different effects, and I want to particularly stress that certain of them can cause a cloudy brain, so they might bring along actually brain fog, even though they might be used ironic, ironically uh, to treat brain fog. One particular drug that is not available in the United States that I find very helpful, it's called rupatadine. Uh, it's available in Latin America, Canada, you know, Europe, and it's important because, as you can see, uh, in a couple of those publications, it blocks actually mast cells, so it's an antihistamine that not only blocks the effect of histamine after it's been released, but the actual release of histamine from our cells. And as you can see at the bottom, a study was shown that it improves quality of life in mastocytosis patients. And in order to improve quality of life in anybody that has a complicated disease, it must be having effects more than just blocking histamine, uh, which I ascribe to the fact that it actually blocks the mast cells. And we published a paper that amitriptyline, as I told you, the tricyclic antidepressant, and procoperazine, which is very well known because it's the antimatic composite, uh, they themselves can block mast cells. And I find especially uh, procoperazine or composite helpful because many people that have migraines, whether it's EDS or mastocytosis patients, are nauseated and they cannot actually take anything by mouth. And composite, as you know, exists as a suppository. So basically you can get, if I can say, two birds with one stone because you can actually uh, take care of the nausea and vomiting as well as block the mast cells, which are involved, of course, in migraines, and therefore you can help you know, with migraines. And then there are all kinds of other mediators coming from the mast cells, such as leukotrienes, for which we have singular that is used in asthma, prostaglandins that might be blocked by aspirin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I will finish by talking about... Uh, natural molecules, especially one called uh, luteoli. So are there really any mast cell blockers? There really aren't. Uh, even though I even said rupated in blocks mast cells, the effect is sort of partial, if you wish. And a drug that was called chromolysodium or gastrochromnab because primarily is used for GI problems, uh, it's not really very effective. So technically, we don't have very good drugs to block mast cells. But the natural molecules called flavonoids, especially luteolin, do that, and I'll show you some results quickly. Uh, let me skip this because it's not uh, that relevant. Uh, and uh, this is basically to say that even though we thought chromolin was useful as a mast cell stabilizer, recent publications show basically that it doesn't even do that in mice, let alone in humans. So what are flavonoids? Flavonoids are found in all green plants and seeds. As you can see at the left-hand side, complicated uh, tree, there are about 3,000 of them, actually. They're very 
a potent antioxidant. We have oxidative stress anytime we have a problem, especially inflammation. They're anti-inflammatory. We show that it blocks mast cells. They're also neuroprotective, but unfortunately, less than about 15% are absorbed orally, making it difficult uh, to give, and I'll tell you how we might be able to bypass that. In one particular uh, publication, if you imagine that each bar, uh, color bar, is about 100,000 uh, mast cells uh, in uh, separate test tubes, we trigger them with another molecule called neurotensin coming from nerves, but in this case, we pre-treated the cells in culture for about five minutes with a flavonoid luteolin. And on the vertical axis, we do not indicate how much is released, but how much was inhibited. And as you can see, histamine was inhibited by 50%, that meat tenderizer by 80%, and the rest are molecules that cause inflammation inhibited by 90% or so. So luteolin very quickly in the uh, test tube can actually block uh, these cells. And here are some papers uh, from us indicating that flavonoid luteolin, again, can block flashing, and many of the mastocytosis patients actually flash. And it can also block keratinocytes, and keratinocytes is part of the skin that actually gets uh, going, it proliferates uh, in psoriasis. So we might be able to actually help with both flashing and psoriasis. I will very quickly mention these two slides because there are two molecules that can be genetically identified. One is called P10 at the top, that's an inhibitory molecule, and the other is called uh, mTOR, which is actually an activator. P10 blocks mTOR. So if genetically you're missing P10, mTOR will actually raise its ugly head and it will stimulate mast cells so you might have a problem. And in fact, some patients do actually lack uh, P10 and it's worth measuring it. Uh, let me just skip this, uh, to say that especially in children with autism, we show that up to 60% of children have allergic-like uh, symptoms. And in fact, other studies have shown that allergic diseases are associated with behavior problems, which I showed you earlier, with ADHD, uh, as well as with autism. So there are many more studies uh, showing this. Uh, here is allergic symptoms in Asperger syndrome, which is high-functioning autism. And particularly telling, about 30% of autistic individuals have antibodies against their brain, as it's shown on the lower-hand side panel. And in order for that to happen, that means that the blood-brain barrier that protects the brain must have been actually disrupted at some point. And I already show you that mast cells can disrupt the barrier uh, because of stress. In this particular case, they tried to find out if the presence of autoantibodies correlated with any other disease, and as you can see, strongly correlated only with allergic symptoms, making this whole story that I've been telling you uh, more plausible. So what we did is we created actually a few supplements. Uh, in this case, uh, called NeuroProtec, we added luteolin along with two uh, cousins of luteolin, quercetin and rutin. Basically, we added the other two to keep the gut uh, enzymes and the liver enzymes sort of busy uh, by chewing up quercetin and rutin to allow luteolin to escape and get into the brain. And we have very good results, published data, uh, not only by us, by other colleagues as well, on uh, helping uh, children with autism and patients with brain fog. Uh, we also created another molecule, uh, another uh, supplement uh, that's called FibroProtec, that has quite a bit of um, beneficial uh, effect on patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Uh, uh, all of these supplements, uh, one can look up on algonaut.com. Uh, and in fact, for anybody that might have more than one problem, let's say someone has a brain fog and also the chronic fatigue of fibromyalgia, uh, if you were to buy uh, NeuroProtec, uh, Algonaut will give you basically the FibroProtec uh, half price. And you can see here, uh, I received uh, one of many patents about using uh, such molecules to treat basically brain inflammation and related uh, disorder. I'll skip this with a study done uh, on uh, autistic patients. I'll skip this because it relates specifically to mastocytosis patients. And just to say that this is not the end of the story. We actually now have identified a new molecule um, uh, it's quite plentiful, basically, in grape seeds and in artichoke. 
It's called tetramethoxyluteolin, so it's, it's a sort of a cousin of luteolin. But if we were to uh, look at this panel, we stimulated mast cells with this peptide substance P. We measured another B tenderizer coming out of the mast cells called beta hexosaminidase. But in this case, we pretreated the cells either with chromaline that was considered until now to be the mast cell stabilizer or luteolin or methoxyluteolin uh, called methlute here. And the first panel is actually control cells without anything. And as you can see, by adding substance P, you get a very large bar, meaning that the mast cells are releasing this enzyme. Chromaline inhibits it a little bit, luteolin much better, and methoxyluteolin even better. So we can do even better than what we've done so far with luteolin, and this will be going actually into some supplements you know, within a year. And you can see actually, if you were to look at various doses, uh, the black line is luteolin, the red or the blue line is methoxyluteolin. So the fact that this line is lower, that means it inhibits basically the release of various molecules from the cells much better. Now, do we have anything topical for anybody that might have either eczema or hives or cutaneous mastocytosis? We have, of course, hydrocortisone, but it's not very helpful, surprisingly, in most cases. There's something called doxepin. Uh, it, hardly anybody uses it. It's a tricyclic antidepressant in a cream. Chromaline doesn't exist actually in the market. Some people just take chromaline and homemade it, and it really doesn't work. And uh, we just put out, um, uh, after trying it in about 200 patients and about two years' worth of trials, methoxyluteolin into a skin lotion, and it will be called uh, Gentle Derm, and you can look it up either in algonaut.com or Gentle Derm. Dot com. It will be available um, in, um, uh, in July. And in fact, I'm leaving tomorrow for Barcelona at the European Congress of the Academy to present actually our data on this. And what is actually uh, quite interesting is all the flavonoids are yellow that prevented us actually from using them in skin lotion because it will be quite you know, ugly. It will turn yellow, basically. Methoxyluteolin is not only more potent than any other flavonoid, but it does not have color, and it's allowed us actually to put it into a skin lotion. So I've already talked about that slide, and I'm finishing by basically showing you the group. Um, a third of the uh, individuals there, the colleagues, are actually graduate students. Uh, one third are postdoctoral fellows, and there are two technicians. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see me looking actually at the microscope at the bone marrow biopsy of the patient that I described to you had actually um, mast cells uh, expressing receptors for CRH. Uh, and uh, in fact, she standing behind me is that patient who now is my clinical assistant. Um, if anybody needs to get to me, you can write at drtheoharides at gmail.com. But it might take a while for me to answer. Uh, because I'm traveling quite a bit and I'm getting about 10 emails a day, actually. Uh, but you can find pretty much uh, everything that I've been telling you, in addition to the fact, of course, that this uh, is being taped, at the site which is called mustcellmaster.com. And I have two nonprofit uh, organizations, one primarily in the States called autismfreeprain.org and one uh, in Greece, so most of the information there, I try to put it up in Greek because many patients in Greece don't necessarily read English, called brain-gate.org. And at the right-hand side, I'm indicating the various funding sources that have helped with my research. And I thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Doctor. Um, you presented a wealth of information. We are so grateful. Um, we have over 150 attendees live tonight. That's wonderful. They're very, they're very engaged in the chat box um, discussing the content you're presenting. And um, I'm sure that um, they've submitted a lot of good questions for you. If you would have time to um, click on the Q&A icon at the top to um, access their questions, um, we'd really okay. appreciate that. All right, let me kind of try to go quickly uh, through them. And there might be some okay. duplicates, and I might skip those. So one question is, it's kind of cute. Uh, I got a message from the Mastocytosis Society about the seminar, but I never heard of EDS. Am I at the right place? You're right at the right place. So uh, obviously I spoke quite a bit of mastocytosis. Uh, EDS, in case you, know, you don't know, obviously many of the other uh, attendees actually do, is a genetic disorder that affects actually the connective tissue. Uh, so 
uh, patients have very hypermobile joints, but as I indicated at the very beginning, they also have neurologic symptoms, headaches, pain, fatigue, blah, 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 uh, dysautonomia, etc. And as I also indicated, strangely enough, about 1 in 10 mastocytosis patients also have EDS, even though I don't quite understand why. Next question, gene variant reports which are readily accessible to people through another such services valuable diagnosis dis disorders. Okay, this is a question mark. Uh, I don't know about this service, uh, live well all. Oops, <laughs> uh, someone disagree disagreed. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know the service, so it could well be that it helps actually people diagnose these disorders. I have to look it up. Um, uh, myself before I can actually pronounce judgment there. How do you know if lots of allergies, quote unquote, is actually a mast cell disorder? What differentiates the two? Allergies basically, bona fide allergies are 100% mast cell driven. What is new is that, as I indicated, many people have allergic-like problems that still trigger the mast cell, but the triggers is not an allergen. It can be, you know, viruses, molds, you know, stress, etc. Um, so the differentiation is one of the most difficult parts. Uh, but the bottom line is, if in fact you have any telltale sign of allergies, and especially if you ever had an anaphylactic reaction after a wasp uh, sting, uh, you've got to be evaluated for mast cell disorder because it can also be life life threatening. Uh, so I would I would rather err on the side of this being a mast cell disorder than than not. Um, uh, is there believed to be a viral basis to mast cell disorders? Are the studies going in this regard? I would not say that there is a viral basis of mast cell disorders, but we know that viruses trigger mast cells. There's no question about it. Viruses bind to specialized receptors on the surface called toll-like receptors or TLRs and they do actually trigger the cells. And in fact, we're finding more and more actually patients that have been exposed to viruses as well as to Lyme disease, which is not a virus, that actually have uh, muscle-related problems, or they might have had allergies that now actually become uh, more generalized um, because of such exposures. Um, how many uh, PPI with muscle problems get severe chest pain. Oh, patients, I apologize. Uh, I can't seem to get mine resolved. I would say that about uh, almost as, as many as 70% of systemic mastocytosis patients do get chest pain or palpitations, but I have to stress that chest pain can come actually from gastroesophageal uh, reflux, and about 50% of uh, that reflux involves actually another cell type called eosinophils, and eosinophils always go where mast cells go. And in fact, the drug that I mentioned, rupatadine, is extremely good because, I didn't say this earlier, not only it's an antihistamine, not only blocks mast cells, but it actually blocks eosinophils as well. So very good for eosinophilic esophagitis. Now, chest pains, of course, can be confusing because they can be associated with other problems, so, you know, I don't want to kind of whitewash the possibility that there might be something else uh, in this particular patient. Uh, other question. I have the diagnosis of EDS hypermobility type and MCAS. So MCAS stands for mast cell activation syndrome. I also have allergies and anaphylactic reactions to over 30 mad foods chemicals. I've had night documented anaphylactic shocks. Skin testing to lidocaine resulted in cardiac respiratory arrest. That's pretty horrible. Is the MCAS responsible for the increased allergic episodes? What part of the EDS play in the extreme allergies? Uh, is the MCAS, meaning muscle activation, responsible? I would say yes. But with such severe reactions, uh, if you have not uh, been tested with bone marrow biopsy, you should. Uh, we tend to lump symptoms under MCAS, but anybody in my book that has had an anaphylactic reaction, uh, especially nine documented reactions, should have a double uh, double actually biopsy, bone marrow biopsy, and definitely triptase uh, uh, measurements in the blood. Uh, this particular patient, if they're interested, they can email me. I mean, anybody can, but uh, this particular patient, you know, needs help a little faster probably than others. How are the DPS pumps affected in mast cell disorders? Okay, that's a whole different uh, area. 
So ATP is what stores and delivers energy to the body. Um, the pumps that allow molecules to come in and out the mast cells or any cell type, including for instance calcium, that depend on pumps that require ATP uh, for them to actually function. There is no known ATPase related problem in the pumps in mast cells that I know of. So uh, unlike, for instance, problems as in cystic fibrosis and other uh, diseases and some neurologic diseases where the ATPases are involved, I don't know of any such involvement in mast cells. My doctor is having trouble locating a lab to do the 24-hour urine test. Where can this be done? You can do it by calling Quest Laboratories, Q-U-E-S-T. Uh, they will actually come to your home and collect the, the urine, and they do all the other testing that is required in the blood as well. Problem is, if they come uh, to your home, uh, that visit might not be covered by insurance, uh, so it might be a little tricky. Uh, otherwise, large hospitals should be able to do it. Uh, I'm not, I'll be amazed if a large hospital cannot do it, but even in large hospitals, they send it out many times to Quest rather than doing it themselves. Uh, next, should someone with MCAT, that's another acronym, and many times they're confusing. So MCAT stands for mast cell uh, activation disease. Uh, in general, let's just call them mast cell disorders. Whether it's MCAT or MCAS, uh, they're all under mast cell uh, disorders. And in fact, in the New England Journal of Article Review, we decided to just call them mast cell disorders rather than use acronyms. They're so confusing. So should someone with MCAT avoid having imaging tests using contrast, such as an MRI, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I would say most of the time, yes. If it's absolutely necessary, uh, that patient uh, should be premedicated with a lot of antihistamine. Uh, and they should be ready, actually, with, uh, with a, um, epinephrine, basically, intramuscular uh, injector, which is called EpiPen, in case uh, they crash uh, during the time. Most of the time, we do okay without contrast. In certain cases, especially with brain-related problems, you do have to have contrast. Uh, so it's, it's really a decision between uh, the physicians and the patient, but the physicians ought to know that someone has a problem, and many times they do not. So what I actually advocate and, and help sometimes patients do is in addition to having a bracelet uh, saying mastocytosis, which many physicians might not have a clue what it is, I, I help them create like a half a page that can be in, you know, in plastic sort of uh, uh, jacket or whatever, uh, indicating basically the name, uh, address, and a picture of the patient. And on the left-hand side, I sort of put the symptoms, uh, which may vary uh, in various patients. On the right-hand side, I put all the things they respond to. And at the bottom, including drugs and contrast media, and at the bottom, I put the drugs if any, and sometimes there are very few that can help them. So in case there's an emergency, they can just show the card rather than having someone try to look up things uh, on the Internet, which, of course, at an emergency room, they're not likely to do. Um, next, what do you believe is the root cause of mast cell destabilization? Well, we don't really call it destabilization, uh, although, you, you know, one can call it that. Uh, basically, a, a mast cell can either fire or not fire, release uh, one or many molecules, and unfortunately in medicine we look for triggers, uh, but in fact we should be looking for inhibitors. So if we can imagine a mast cell is inhibited, then the word destabilization would mean that it is disinhibited, that's how I understand the word. And we don't know of any natural inhibitors of mast cells in our own body. Interestingly enough, a good portion of the granules of the mast cells contain something called chondroitin sulfate. And I won't have time to go into it because chondroitin sulfate is also involved in the pathophysiology of EDS. So if mast cells contain chondroitin sulfate and they release it, chondroitin sulfate acts back on the mast cells and shuts it down. And we are actually studying now mast cells from mastocytosis patients to see if, in fact, the mast cells do contain chondroitin sulfate because if they do not, they will be missing uh, an innate uh, inhibitor of themselves. And this is just an example. Uh, another one. Today, Dr. Lauren Safrin. Dr. Lauren Safrin is a hematologist who recently moved, actually, uh, to Minnesota. Uh, he's a good friend, 
and he he he's very interested in patients that have tons of different symptoms that would qualify for muscle cell activation syndrome. So Dr. Lawrence Safrin told me that all my diagnosed conditions could be explained by muscle cell activation syndrome. This includes a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, obesity, and even breast cancer. Would you agree with this possibility? What medications do you think would help with any of these disorders, especially breast cancer? First of all, let me say that even though I agree on many levels with uh, Dr. Afrin, I also disagree because certain of these diseases can be bona fide diseases on their own right, not necessarily explained by mast cells, even though I have been one of the few that have published that mast cells are involved in chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and multiple sclerosis. In fact, I have in front of me a paper that I was asked to review. I don't know who wrote it, and the title of the paper is called Are Mast Cells the Key? to multiple sclerosis. So, but these diseases are multifactorial. And even though I have no doubt that mast cells participate, I'd be hard pressed to say that it is the mast cells that is causing all these problems. And because sometimes uh, colleagues like Dr. Afrin uh, might say that they are caused um, by mast cells, they also create a negativity among other colleagues who now don't believe basically the muscles may participate just because uh, you know, some people might say it causes the problems, if you know what I'm saying. Now, having said that, we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and so did others, uh, that mast cells accumulate around solid tumors, especially breast cancer, but also ovarian and pancreatic cancer. And what they do is we thought that they accumulate in order to kill the tumor, because they can release tumor necrosis factor called TNF, which can kill the tumor cells. But unfortunately, the tumor cells are much smarter than us. What the breast cancer does is it recruits the mast cells, it prevents it from releasing tumor necrosis factor that would kill it, and it makes it release selectively endothelial growth factor that makes new vessels grow and allow the tumor to feed itself and metastasize. If I could actually make the mast cell release only TNF, I could actually literally cure uh, breast cancer in, in its place. And in fact, many studies have shown that the more breast, I'm sorry, the more mast cells you have around breast cancer, the more aggressive uh, the breast cancer is. However, we do not have, as I said, ways to block the mast cells. Having said that, there are numerous studies. You can look them up actually by just Googling them or going to PubMed dot gov for public uh, medicine, the Library of Congress basically, uh, and then gov and just ask the questions. There are many, many studies, some epidemiological, showing that the more consumption of flavonoids, the less uh, uh, ca uh, cancer in that population. And many studies where luteolin has been used either alone or with anti-cancer drugs, including breast cancer, with very good results. In fact, uh, we have a study that might be funded with Emory University uh, looking at the combination of uh, luteolin, the flavonoid that I mentioned, uh, in breast cancer. However, I don't have any evidence that such molecules will necessarily cure uh, cancer by themselves, even though I do use them quite a bit as additional sort of, you know, uh, if not treatment, uh, supportive therapy. What role does copper toxicity um, bio inability, I'm not quite sure what that says, play in mast cell disorders. Um, I don't know about copper as such, but we've studied other uh, metals. Uh, mercury definitely degranulates the mast cells. Uh, aluminum actually can stimulate the muscles, but we don't necessarily degranulate them. I don't know about copper. Uh, next, the flashing that leaves inflamed areas on my skin, mostly enhanced a cross bridge of nose, cheeks, leaves it dehydrated and chopped. Sometimes even tiny blisters that scab. My question is, while is cetirizine, cetirizine is another antihistamine, or meprazole, that's a pump inhibitor, it's like an, <coughs> protects the stomach, Benadryl, another antihistamine, famotidine, which is an antihistamine, again, protects the stomach, and chromoline, which I indicated is supposed to be a muscle blocker, but it really is not. Uh, for my cocktail. Is this to be expected to go on indefinitely or is there any missing component? Uh, uh, first of all, without knowing all the symptoms, 
uh, what this patient is doing is 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 pretty good, but I would uh, almost certainly expect that you will get much be more benefit if you were to try basically uh, either the NeuroProtect or the FibroProtect, especially with a, a gentle derm skin lotion together twice a day when it will come out in July. If this around a dozen times a day, some caused by reaction stress, here it goes, or my favorite, I can't do much about right now, hot flashes and changing temperatures, that's very common in mastocytosis patients. Trying to do this as naturally as I can, but I've had this lag, mind, okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I think that, um, first of all, one can, uh, if, if you allow me the expression, play around with the doses and the drugs, uh, and I don't know what dosage this patient is taking, but uh, adding basically the NeuroProtect and FibroProtect, uh, about uh, two to four capsules a day, and in order to increase the absorption, the content of the capsules is mixed with olive uh, fruit extract. So you can imagine olive oil, if you squeeze it, then you're left with the pit and, and the sort of flesh of the olive. If you squeeze that, uh, you get actually thicker uh, oil or extract. Um, in Mediterranean countries, you can buy it actually for, uh, for salad. Um, but by mixing that with a powder, the luteolin, you increase the absorption about five times. And that's how the capsules in FibroProtect and NeuroProtect actually are made. Uh, can you tell me how copper histamine and estrogen play a role in EDS? Uh, that I do not know. Uh, I know that estrogens actually make the triggers of mast cells uh, be more effective triggers. In other words, uh, estrogens increase the firing of the mast cells and they will increase the release of histamine. We had published this many years ago and two papers uh, were published recently in Asthmatics. Uh, and if you, if you can imagine, uh, the all autoimmune diseases are actually more prevalent in women than men. I don't know about copper. Uh, but copper does bind to all kinds of molecules. So if it were to be binding, for instance, to uh, connective tissue molecules, it may actually uh, affect the sort of whole makeup of, of EDS patients. But I do not know. I also have been diagnosed with POTS and EDS type 3 and sleep apnea. Uh, okay, so POTS is basically postural uh, uh, tachycardia syndrome. So when you try to stand up, uh, your heart actually beats faster in order to push the blood up to your brain so you don't faint. But in POTS patients, sometimes called also dysautonomia, because we have the autonomic nervous system that controls basically our body, uh, and dysautonomia means that it just doesn't function as normally anymore. Um, these patients actually continue to have tachycardia uh, persistently after they might have actually, you know, stood up. Uh, now, sleep apnea, uh, so, so POTS, as I said, is associated with, it's quite common in mastocytosis, and from what I read, is quite common in EDS patients as well. Sleep apnea is somewhat uh, different um, it's been associated with hypertension, with uh, adenoids in your throat, uh, with, uh, uh, with a lot of weight, uh, with certain uh, uh, diseases like anxiety, etc. So it may be related to the fact that POTS and EDS, you know, will make someone anxious to begin with, or there might be something else uh, going on there. I don't have enough evidence to really say that they're necessarily related. Um, Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, this is a little more complicated now. Um, okay, uh, first of all, it's, uh, this part is easy. How, how do so many people with EDS have MCAS? And does acupuncture help? As I said, I have no idea why. And in fact, what I know, the pathophysiology or the pathogenesis uh, of uh, EDS does not necessarily uh, make me uh, understand what happens with uh, patients with mastocytosis. Unless, as I said, uh, chondroitin sulfate from mast cells is protective, and if they do not have it, that might affect um, patients with EDS who already have actually problems with connective tissue. But this is just a wild uh, hypothesis. Uh, acupuncture, to the extent that there are pains, especially diffuse pains, uh, or sensitivity, if you wish, it will help with the diffuse pains. It will not help, to the best of my knowledge, with 
uh, other symptoms of mastocytosis. What testing is involved in getting properly diagnosed and what treatments are available? My daughter has autism as well as possible mastocytosis or muscle cell activation disorder. Trying to get uh, her officially diagnosed, I've heard of luteolin, quercetin, but are there any other viable treatments? Okay, so again, this is a patient that might be best actually just uh, emailing me. Um, I actually published uh, a paper showing that uh, the risk of autism in mastocytosis children is 1 in 10, while at best in the general population, not that it is good when I say it is best, is 1 in 60. So something is going on, and that's what Twitter does actually uh, to study it. So I'm very interested. I was actually, I lectured in Australia uh, just about two weeks ago in Melbourne and Sydney. I saw families that had like two, three, one family with four children actually with uh, autism and all had um, uh, allergy-like problems. One family that had four on the spectrum, uh, two of them had a diagnosis of mastocytosis. And I collected blood from all of those and we'll be studying them. Um, there really aren't any treatments. There's no treatment, as you know, or as you might know, for autism. Uh, if someone is very disruptive or self-injurious, uh, we might give drugs like Ritalin or sometimes, you know, anti-anxiety drugs to calm them down. Sometimes we overdo it. And, in fact, about 80% of all children in the States are given psychotropic drugs, uh, even though I think only a fraction of them, uh, in fact, need them. Uh, the only reason why we use luteolin primarily, and quercetin it was used as a decoy, as I said earlier, to keep uh, the enzymes uh, busy so luteolin uh, escapes, uh, is because we made basically uh, a reasonable effect hypothesis. Uh, if, in fact, uh, so many children have allergic-like problems, and if, in fact, uh, the risk of children with mastocytosis is much higher than autism, the muscles might, must be involved. Uh, especially since we had shown that they open up the gut and the blood-brain barrier, we already know that these patients have autoantibodies against their brain. So we said, well, if the muscles are activated, whether it's in the gut or the skin or the brain, let's block them. And what can we use to block them? We already showed that luteolin is very good in blocking them. The question is, can we get enough of that also in the brain? And that's how we created NeuroProtect. And now we have about 4,000 or so uh, children actually on it. And the only downside is in about 50% of children, they have what we call phenol intolerance. They get hyperactive when they eat chocolate, sometimes berries, strawberries, blueberries. They do not tolerate uh, luteolin or quercetin either because those are phenolic uh, compounds. For that, we created another supplement called low phenol. Um, uh, but again, for those patients, I really need to talk to them because one can do genetic analysis to find out if they lack an enzyme that breaks down uh, phenolic uh, groups rather than just sort of playing around uh, with various uh, preparations. Uh, can you please uh, talk about how mast cell activation in the context of EDS would affect the bladder and the lungs? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, we studied interstitial cystitis of the bladder, which is a sterile bladder disorder for 20 years or so, and we were the first or among the first to show that you get actually bladder mastocytosis. In fact, the European Society of Urology has increased number of mast cells in the detrusor muscle that basically covers the bladder as a criterion for diagnosis of this disease. Lungs are loaded with mast cells, and in fact, that's why, uh, you know, you get asthma when the mast cells are activated, either by allergens or by stress. My late mother had asthma when I was growing up. We were very poor. And every time there will be another financial calamity, she'll just clamp down. She used to tell me she, it was like being in a glass cage and I wanted to break the glass cage to get out, and it was all stress. Um, we published uh, two reviews, basically, over the last two years, uh, one in, in Europe and one here, about uh, stress affecting mast cells uh, in the lungs and causing problems in the lungs. Uh, my hunch is that it is heavily involved. Yes, it is, but it seems to be different and more intense uh, than interstitial cystitis, active bladder, and asthma, and not as effectively controlled. That is absolutely correct. Even in uh, four interstitial cystitis, uh, almost 17 years ago, we developed the first dietary supplement called Cystoprotec, uh, C-Y-S-T-O for like cystitis. And in fact, uh, about one in five patients with cystitis actually have been taking this uh, with very good results over the last so many uh, years. So in such patients, uh, 
I actually recommend the antihistamine hydroxyzine at night, 50 milligrams, and then uh, two capsules of Cystoprotec in the morning and two at night. On a personal note, I just had a transvaginal ultrasound that took about 45 minutes. I had terrible flare of urinary urgency and pelvic pain for over two weeks. Now it seems that mastals are implicated in interstitial cystitis. Absolutely yes. If you go to pubmed.gov and you put my name in interstitial cystitis, uh, we published a review in family practice um, with a colleague from uh, Pennsylvania that is fairly easily written for someone to basically understand. Um, and please expand upon this and recommendations. I already said, I don't know about asthma because it's a little more complicated, but for interstitial cystitis, uh, definitely we use um, Atarax uh, at night, old antihistamine, uh, about 50 milligrams. The uh, four capsules a day, two and two, morning and night of Cystoprotec. If there's a lot of pain, I use Tramadol, as I said earlier. If diagnosed with systemic mastocytosis from a skin biopsy, and then the next biopsy just showed an overgrowth of eosinophils, which is correct. Um, this question is, is a little tricky as it is written. You cannot diagnose systemic mastocytosis only from a skin biopsy, uh, by definition. If you only have mast cells in a skin biopsy, in which case you have cutaneous mastocytosis, 90% of cases of cutaneous mastocytosis, especially in children, are self-limited. You don't get systemic. If you have skin mastocytosis and you also responded to wasp stings with anaphylaxis or you have high triptase in your blood, then you qualify for systemic mastocytosis and you have to have actually a bone marrow biopsy. Now, it says overgrowth of eosinophils. The question is where? Eosinophils don't really overgrow in the skin almost ever. Uh, we see them in the gut, we see them in the lungs, we see them basically in the esophagus. So it's impossible for me to answer without knowing where the overgrowth is. Again, you might want to uh, email me for that. From uh, okay, hoping you may take opportunity during your presentation to discuss any information you might have regarding a possible correlation with seizure activity. Very interesting. My 13-year-old daughter also has seizure disorder, complex partial with slower brain waves which lasts 30 to 60 seconds in length and can occur in succession every 10 to 15 minutes. However, typically she will have 5 to 10 of these seizure-like pre events every day. Now, I said interesting because I, this, page, this, this person is not telling me if uh, their daughter has any other problem. Uh, we've published a number of cases of mastocytosis in children that had seizures that were actually unresponsive to seizure meds and they responded very well to mast cell related basically meds. Um, we've also seen uh, about 20% of children on autism also have uh, seizures. So the most important thing with seizures is to make sure that you uh, exclude any ongoing triggers. Uh, of course, once you have seizures a number of times, you have to go on anti-seizure meds because otherwise you, know, you might have more problems. So we try to exclude metabolic problems like uh, you know, a pituitary tumor, that's a gland in the brain or uh, any problems with the thyroid, or, uh, or any problems with just the way we metabolize. We try to exclude any toxins in the environment, etc., including mold. Mold has been associated with seizures. And then if you do have seizures, unfortunately, you have to buy, buy basically, you know, the drug that has to be given. And if they're related to mast cells, by limiting basically the triggers and blocking the mast cells, uh, you know, you might actually reduce the duration or the frequency of seizures. Um, okay, I've been told by several doctors that even though my son fits an MCAS diagnosis, he cannot have MCAS. He has already been diagnosed with cutaneous mastocytosis. That is not true. Uh, even though I said that cutaneous mastocytosis, you may not have systemic mastocytosis, you can absolutely have uh, symptoms of mast cell activation, which sometimes is as call, called MCAS. Instead of giving you the diagnosis of MCAS, he now has cutaneous mastocytosis with systemic involvement. That's basically just playing around with words. Um, you can email me and I'll, I'll email you back. He has no typical signs of systemic mastocytosis, no gut issues, triptase below 12, but he's on histamine 1, uh, antagonist sodium chromoglycate, and Montelukast, that's actually a leukotriene inhibitor. Uh, for histamine issues, neurologic issues, periodically peeing a lot, and leg pain. Well, to put in question, why is MCAS ruled out automatically? That's because people don't know what it is. 
and many physicians don't like to use the word syndrome, you know, mast cell activation syndrome. That's why I basically call it mast cell disorder, period, and then everybody will know. Um, so in, in this particular patient, I would definitely uh, give them actually um, uh, NeuroProtect, depending on the age, uh, up to uh, six a day, increasing it slowly over a month. Uh, and I would measure uh, urine uh, levels of mediators to know where, where we are because if prostaglandin F is elevated and if the patient can tolerate aspirin, we give them a little aspirin, actually. Next question, is vancomycin always a mast cell trigger? Do all MCAS patients react to it? I would say it's not always a mast cell trigger, but in many cases it's been shown to be a trigger, so unless you absolutely need it, uh, I would shy away from it. However, if it is the only drug that one responds, uh, Dr. Mariana Castells, who is a professor at the Brigham Women's Hospital at Harvard in Boston, uh, is extremely good in desensitizing, especially against drugs. So if you absolutely need it, look up Mariana Castells and, and uh, make an appointment. Is there a connection between MCAS and high cholesterol when diet is not contributor? I believe it is. And I published a paper with a funny title, Must Cell Squeeze the Heart and Stretch the Gird. Uh, there's no question that muscles are involved in obesity, uh, and it's a complicated story, uh, but it is not cholesterol that directly triggers the mast cells. Is there any evidence that rifaxin inactivates mast cells? That's an antibiotic. Many antibiotics, especially that are related to penicillin, uh, can activate mast cells but it varies tremendously from patient to patient uh, in case I'm a male. Again, if, if you responded to, especially severely, you just stay away from it unless you absolutely need it. And if you do, then again, you visit Mariana Castells. Uh, slides aren't ro loading, someone is saying. Hopefully they did load. I take turmeric, curcumin pills for pain. Should be avoiding this due to the salicylate. Well, I don't know if this patient has also muscle related problems um, and, and what kind of problems. Uh, curcumin in general affects a lot of patients negatively even though it's a good anti-inflammatory molecule. So I presume that the question here for pain is for inflammatory type of pain. Uh, that's a different type of pain than, than a sharp pain for instance we might have when you have appendicitis or something. Um, and if you take a lot of curcumin, you cannot take a lot of luteolin because they both are broken down in the liver, and you might basically load up your, your liver enzymes. Um, so I never give curcumin uh, and luteolin to exceed 1,000 milligrams a day. So you can kind of take it from there uh, together. But if uh, someone is sensitive to salicylates, you would have known by now because by taking the propane, you would have had other problems. Any recommendations for a doctor who can help with muscle diagnosis and histamine diagnosis in California? Yes. Uh, there are two of them. They're pretty good. Um, and in fact, for whoever is from California, uh, on uh, look, look up for uh, announcements. You can go to my site. But on unless something goes wrong, on July uh, 25th to 29th, I will be actually giving a patient support a sort of seminar and roundtable discussion in San Francisco in California. And uh, the site that is hosting this is called Must Sell Aware. Uh, I think it's .com, all one word, mustsellaware.com. If you write to me, I'll tell you the names and phone numbers. Otherwise, you can go to the mastocytosissociety.org, the mastocytosissociety.org, and look up uh, uh, the selection where it says a scientific advisory committee, uh, and you will see two people listed from California there. That might be the fastest way to get uh, to them. Uh, is cholinergic, okay, how are we doing with time? I'm half the way through. We're still doing okay? Okay. I guess no one yes, you're still, you're, you're oh, doing okay. okay, no problem. I'm doing okay, okay, sorry. Um, okay, I take claritin. Oh, I'm sorry, there's another one here. Two seconds. Uh, is cholinergic urticaria a sign of mast cell activation disorder? No. You can have urticaria, it's its own diagnosis. 
Mast cells are involved in urticaria, but you can have urticaria without having mast cell disease. Uh, that's where it gets confusing when everything is lumped under uh, mast cell disease. And urticaria, the cholinergic is really a misnomer because uh, cholinergic means acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter released from nerves, but we don't have any evidence actually that uh, urticaria is cholinergic, except that it happens many times when we exercise or when we are uh, exposed to a lot of heat, and we believe that acetylcholine is released, that's why it's called cholinergic. So urticaria, cholinergic urticaria can be in its own right and has, might have nothing to do with mast cell disease, except that many mast cell patients have, are more likely to have uh, you know, urticaria. So you can have urticaria without having mast cell disease, but if you have mast cell disease, you're certainly more likely to have urticaria. And is it dangerous, harmful not to treat um, a cholinergic urticaria and cut if I have a mild case? No, it's not dangerous. If you can live with it and nothing else happens, so be it. Just be aware of the fact that, you know, all kind of other symptoms may be related to this, in which case if you have other symptoms, you know, you should kind of try to see if, if they may derive from this. Does MCAD or mast cell activation uh, disease cause bruising and angioneurotic edema, hyperactivity and excessive thirst? Uh, actually, uh, yes, yes, and possibly no. Angioneurotic edema, it's again a definition of its own. And the diagnosis is very different. So you can see basically swelling of, of the blood vessels, and it looks like it might be hives, but it's not. Uh, and uh, unlike the various molecules that we measure, uh, such as broken down products of histamine and prostaglandins in the urine to identify mastocytosis, in angioneurotic edema, we measure two other molecules, one called C1 esterase inhibitor, and these patients lack this inhibitor, and we measure something called D-dimer. The D-dimer usually is involved in clotting, but evidently it's quite increased in antigenerotic edema as well as in certain types of chronic urticaria. Uh, hyperactivity clearly is present in a lot of master patients. Excessive thirst could be tricky because one can have thirst because they have high sugar, so it might be a pre-diabetic condition, but excessive thirst is also, in fact, I diagnosed two patients, one was in Colorado uh, last year by this time, they came from astrocytosis, and they ended up having actually a, a benign tumor, we call it adenoma of the pituitary gland. The, anterior, the pituitary has two portions, the anterior pituitary releases all the kind of sex hormones, it releases growth hormone, prolactin, uh, FSA, delate, etc. But the posterior releases uh, two hormones, oxytocin, that contracts the uterus, and we give it actually uh, at times to induce labor, uh, although unfortunately it has been associated uh, now with risk of autism. If you've taken too much of that, we call it petrosin, or the antidiuretic hormone. So if you have a tumor there, or benign tumor, you might not be making um, antidiuretic hormone, and you might have a lot of thirst, and you might be kind of acting like you had diabetes, but we call it diabetes insipidus. So one has to basically measure all the pituitary hormones and do an MRI of what is called the tela cella turcica, or Turkish saddle, which is the part of the skull that houses basically uh, the pituitary gland, and if there is a little adenoma, you'll see it. I would hate to actually uh, miss a case like that, especially someone that has um, such symptoms. Uh, can you explain the involvement between uh, the MTHFR uh, mutation and MCAS? Uh, this will take too long. Uh, basically, these mutations are involved in breakdown of certain uh, biogenic amines um, and, uh, and, and also changing of certain molecules by adding what is called a methyl group or methylation. We don't really know uh, how that affects MCAS, even though this MTHFR mutation is found quite common, actually, in children with, uh, with autism. Okay, let's see my... One second. My son is 14 months, and we have been uh, battling food allergies, chronic eczema, and hives at night time for the last six months. This seems to be his only symptoms, food allergies and skin condition. 
Is it still worth pursuing mast cell diagnosis, histamine intolerance, diagnosis, etc.? And I would say three things there. First of all, if the symptoms appear at night, uh, you have to actually look for a couple of things. First of all, if the air, if the air is very dry, they will uh, make basically allergies and eczema and hives worse. Also at night, uh, we're exposed basically to uh, to the bed, to the bed sheets, to uh, all kind of things that actually house dust mites. And the most common trigger of mast cells in the house is actually dust mites. So you need to make sure that you know the the environment is fairly moist, that so there are no dust mites, if it is possible. They're good, you know, air conditioning or you know vacuuming, etc. Sometimes we avoid uh, anything that is not, uh, you know, you can buy uh, bed stuffing that is actually treated so that you know these things don't grow there, etc. If these things continue, then uh, the question is, what does one eat at night? Is the food at night uh, likely to cause problems? That's why the allergies occur at night. So if you're eating something at night, you're not likely to eat in the morning. That might be a problem. But if this continue, then I would certainly at least uh, pursue the, the proper testing. And what is the proper testing? You do what is called the RAST test, R-A-S-T. Uh, that looks for allergens in your blood. And then you do also a test which is not quantitative. It's only qualitative uh, for food intolerance. And you see, you need to eliminate certain foods, and in many cases, we actually do eliminate foods. Next, I take claritin, that's an antihistamine, and pepsid, which is a stomach protector, daily. Do you think that's often enough to be contributing to brain fog? Uh, I guess this individual is asking if they're taking too much that contributes to brain fog, so I assume from the question that they do have brain fog. Uh, in order for claritin to be causing brain fog, perhaps it will not cause brain fog. Claritin, you will have to take actually, you know, uh, I don't know, up to ten, you know, eight times the recommended dose before you will get brain fog, except that 10% of people are so se sensitive with mastocytosis to everything that, you know, anything is possible. In, in that case, I will either reduce the dose or change to another antihistamine such as Zyrtec or Allegra uh, and see what happens. What is the difference between mastocytosis and MCAS? Again, we, I, as you will see in the review in the New England Journal of Medicine, we call them all mast cell uh, disorders. So mastocytosis is either cutaneous, meaning only skin, or systemic, which means it involves other organs. MCAS, or mast cell activation, or mast cell activation syndrome, you have symptoms of mast cell activation without having necessarily either skin problems or systemic problems, but if you have either one, either skin problems or systemic, you can have activation which makes things worse. In other words, cutaneous mastocytosis can be a freestanding diagnosis, systemic mastocytosis is a freestanding diagnosis, muscle activation can be a freestanding diagnosis, but you can have muscle activation with either one of the cutaneous or the systemic. I know it's confusing, uh, but one is not necessarily exclusive of the other. Uh, let's see. Uh, is it possible to have muscle activation without ever experiencing anaphylaxis? Yes. But still have high urine methylhistamine levels? Yes. Bone pain, brain fog, hives, itching, dysautonomia? Yes. Uh, do you see patients? I don't see patients by myself anymore. Uh, but uh, what I do, even though, you know, I am like way behind, I'm like 300 emails behind, uh, when I get basically uh, uh, an email, uh, I'll, I'll qualify the patient in a second. Uh, I, wherever wherever the, the mails are coming from, uh, my my clinical assistant that I alluded to earlier, actually who herself has both mastocytosis, systemic mastocytosis and EDS, by the way, uh, she now creates, even though she's in Michigan and I'm in Boston, she creates electronic files for me. So at the moment I get the email, she looks at them, you know, once a week or whenever, and then create an electronic file. So the file might say, for instance, uh, USA uh, uh, does mastocytosis, does uh, your last name in uppercase letter, then your first name, lowercase letter, then in parentheses if you have any other sort of conditions. That way I can you know, find them quickly. I send out a form letter depending what the apparent problem is. 
suggesting that, you know, one can do X, Y, and Z or visit X, Y, and Z physicians. If it appears like that's impossible to follow through, uh, then, you know, someone might send me some information. The problem is if you send me a half a page, you know, I'll review it and try to kind of answer. Most of the time when I say, okay, send me some information, I get like 50 pages. And then it becomes impossible to really do justice because if I spend, you know, hours of 50 patients, I'll never get to the other patients. Be it as it may, I try to exchange, you know, up to three emails trying to either give some suggestions or recommend or whatever. Uh, I cannot keep it going, obviously, because I'll never get to the other patients. Now, even though I don't see patients uh, now anymore in the States, because I have so much research and teaching, etc., I do actually see five times a year, uh, you know, every two months or so, or two and a half months, patients in Athens, Greece, uh, for three reasons. Um, one, because I helped kind of establish a small outpatient clinic there, and we can pretty much do all the testing in one spot rather than having to send them to yet another specialist who will send them to yet another, you know, a clinic or whatever, et cetera. So you can kind of get them all done. For instance, I had a family come actually from Denmark uh, just last week that I was there. Second is because, uh, for better or worse, uh, you know, you can get a little vacation uh, done in Greece and get everything done at the same time. Uh, and, and I'm not being, uh, you know, silly here. Stress is such a factor that for many patients, just to get away from everything for a week, uh, does actually a lot of good to them over, you know, beyond whatever else, you know, we can do. The third is because some of the medications we give are available, as I said earlier, in Europe, and they're all available in the States. So, uh, if anybody wants to vacation uh, in Greece, uh, you can let me know, and I'll see you in Athens. All right, let me go further down. Uh, I've res I, I, I'm reactive to mold. I removed, oops, just a second, I went a little too fast. Um, I remove fall from my flooded basement by replacing drywall. Are there any other measures I should take to reduce spores? As I said earlier, spores is not necessarily uh, uh, the only problem. Uh, in, in two cases, I had actually, and I'm not advocating you do that necessarily, but they had to change their homes entirely uh, because the microtoxins that are volatile are all over the place. And you can just cannot get rid, get rid of them no matter what you do. So if you continue to react, uh, then you might have to bite the bullet and, and change places. There's nothing else I can think of. Uh, there's no way to prevent them other than taking whatever things can stabilize the mast cells that we've been speaking about. But as long as the triggers continue, you might continue to have problems. Are you familiar with MCAT experts in the UK? Actually, only, uh, only one. And unfortunately, uh, he ran into the same problem that Dr. Afrin did. Uh, he was seeing so many patients uh, and, and bringing so, so little income in that they literally let him go from the hospital where he was working originally. So I don't think there's anybody anymore. Uh, for better or worse, uh, I was asked to see actually um, uh, a young girl that has both muscle-related problems and autism. So I was flown basically to London about three weeks ago uh, to kind of help them out, and I think I did. Um, but hopefully with the New England Journal of Medicine coming out, a lot more people might become interested in it because it will be a little more apparent that this thing is quite prevalent. Um, how does mast cell disorders relate to allergies? As I said, you can have allergies uh, which depend on mast cells without having a mast cell disorder, meaning cutaneous systemic or, or mast cell activation disorder. So mast cell activation, in a way, exists in allergies. And mast cells are involved, which I know it's confusing, uh, but in, in allergies, you respond to specific triggers. Mastocytosis patients respond to God knows however many triggers, especially odors. You know, I would say most of the patients respond to perfumes, uh, to Clorox, to, you know, cleaners, etc., for which, of course, we're not truly allergic. Um, uh, if you test positive for skin test allergies, then does that rule out muscle disorder? No, it does not. Um, uh, many patients can be truly allergic, and therefore the skin testing will be positive, uh, but you might respond to, you know, a hundred different other things, and, and, and you need to go through the diagnosis, especially if you responded uh, with anaphylaxis to uh, wasp sting. Oops, we have 10 minutes. Okay, let me try to go quickly. I'll look at the questions to see if I've already answered. 
uh, source allergies, run a complete blood count, uh, had elevated red cell, uh, blah, 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 uh, et cetera. Uh, okay, this, this has nothing to do with either EDS or mast cells. We're talking about lymphocytosis. Uh, you might want to, you know, send me an email about this because it's fairly complicated. Uh, how do you feel about memory foam beds? I don't have any experience at all. I reacted to Lyric and Neurontin, Doxepin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can't take any non-steroidals or narcotics. Are there any other choices? Uh, if, it is, uh, if it is pain, uh, it's now getting very complicated because this patient responds to everything. Uh, some people do okay with uh, belladonna alkaloids. That's like um, uh, it's, um, they're suppositories that have a little opium and a little bit of uh, belladonna is, uh, is a drug that affects the nervous system. Uh, but this patient might need to be uh, de desensitized to at least one painkiller in order to survive if, in fact, they have such a problem. Uh, many patients do okay with what is called um, uh, duragesic. Uh, duragesic is a transdermal that contains the drug fentanyl that is much stronger than morphine but does not affect the mast cells. And if you respond to it, you can just pull off the, the skin adhesive and, and you, you, know, you haven't swallowed anything and you, you can do okay. Uh, I have sleep issues and currently take trazodol and clonazepam. I've diagnosed with MCAS. You can try melatonin and the drug Adarax at small dosages, 20 to 25 milligrams at night might help. What about flonase? Is it helpful with muscle disorders? No. Are blood tests for food allergies accurate? Uh, no. Uh, they're only suggestive, and unfortunately, uh, these tests can be positive if you eat a lot of something. So if you eat, let's say, two eggs a day every day, it will turn out to be positive for eggs, and, and you might think that you cannot tolerate eggs. If you, however, don't eat the food very often, it turns out to be positive, I tend to believe that. I was treated with Zoller. Uh, Zoller is a drug that neutralizes IgE that is involved in allergies for six months. In my seventh treatment, I had an anaphylactic reaction. Unfortunately, it can happen. Uh, Zoller is actually a protein, it's an antibody injected into the body. The body builds up sensitivity to it, and you can react to it. Unfortunately, you can, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, there's another question about the MTFR gene. Again, it's too complicated to answer. Is the time of day we make meds important? Uh, yes. Um, we used to think that we have to spread them out during the day. Uh, now it appears that taking actually a mega dose in the morning uh, might be better, except for drugs that might be involved actually uh, in sleep, in which case you have to take them at night. Flavonoids like quercetin and luteolin disappear from the body in six hours, so you really have to spread them out at least twice a day. Even if my son issues is in a mass cell issue, would neuroprotect vitamin blah, 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 be a good supplement regimen to reduce hives? The answer is yes. And as I say, even if nothing works, you get a little Mediterranean diet in a capsule. Uh, the luteolin is an extra from chamomile, and the rest is actually olive extract. So, you know, you can't go wrong. Again, uh, except for those people that are food intolerant, in which case they might become a little hyperactive. Is there any rel relatively simple way to distinguish muscle condition for mostly dysautonomia? No. Uh, muscle condition and dysautonomia are entirely different, except that we have dysautonomia, uh, with muscle-related problems, and since the muscles exist in the brain, they might contribute, but for the time being, we don't have evidence that one causes the other. Um, I'm skipping one that is very complicated. Could EDS pain lend to increase substance P, uh, which then could increase muscle activity? The answer is yes. Uh, my three-year-old saw his cutaneous muscle, but reacts daily, flashing, blah, 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 blah. Is Plumicord safe for your shortness of breath? Plumicord we use in asthma. I would say yes, unless he or she, or it's a he, uh, has sensitivity to those drugs. What do we know about familial links? Uh, mastocytosis is not genetic to the best that we know. There have been some familial cases, uh, and those are rare, actually, cases, and the presentation is very different. In one particular familial tree, they appear, actually, with bleeding, which confuses everybody because they might think it's a different disorder. Remember that the muscle granules have a heparin, and heparin is anti-clotting. So if they release tons of heparin, the mycos is actually bleeding. Uh, what about those that have trouble with bone marrow? 
Uh, is this normal? Have met several in support group that had the same happen, getting bone marrow, trouble with getting bone marrow. I'm not quite sure why one has uh, trouble getting bone marrow, uh, marrow, so I'm not quite sure how to answer. Uh, one can get bone, bone marrow aspiration with a needle or bone marrow, and they can get it either from the sternum, which is what they're using in Europe, or the pelvic uh, uh, bone. If it is pain, one can be actually premedicated with um, lorazepam, which is Ativan, and some antihistamines ahead of time. I experience a great deal of joint and neuralgia pains. I'm allergic to non-steroidals. I used to take tramadol, which was very helpful, and start getting the same reaction. Uh, again, you might have to desensitize, but they're different, actually. Uh, uh, Anti-seizure meds, such as you know, gabapentin, pregabalin, etc., that might be worth it. Is chromogranin A always only found in AMCAS? Uh, chromogranin A actually is a molecule found not in mast cells. It's found actually in cells that are like mast cells, called either enterochromaffin cells, that occur in a condition called carcinoid, which is a benign condition, it's not a tumor, or benign tumor of the adrenal cells called <coughs> pheochromocytoma. Uh, so any time that runs chromogranin A in their blood, you have to look uh, for uh, a carcinoid tumor in the gut, most of the time, it appears in the appendix. I've seen a connection with EDS and autism. Is there a relation with EDS and dyslexia? Yes. I've seen a couple of cases with EDS and autism. I don't know enough to really call it. Uh, can you comment on the discovery of classical lymphatic vessels in the CNS, published in nature, how that might affect our understanding of the etiology of muscle disorders? Uh, that's an incredible catch for whoever actually uh, uh, saw that. Uh, we never thought that there would be lymphatics uh, in the brain. Uh, or in the central nervous system, and I think uh, we will be finding more about it because mast cell mediators traffic to the lymphatics, and they cause problems through that. But again, this is a huge topic. Uh, do you know if EDS can be comorbid with mastocytosis? As I said, it appears about 1 in 10 have both. Extreme eating all over and no rashes most of the time. Can you diagnose without testing? Uh, no, this sounds like you know chronic urticaria, which means chronic eating. Chronic urticaria can be idiopathic, meaning we have no clue, or it can be autoimmune. In those cases, we measure in the blood antibodies against the Ig receptor, and that might actually explain things, and the treatment might be similar to what I've been saying about mastocytosis. I'm coming to the end. Are there specific tests with colonoscopy or endoscopy with mast cell issues? Unfortunately, you don't know, we don't know where to biopsy, uh, and most of the time when you have GI problems that seem similar to uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, we don't know where to, to biopsy. Um, most of the time, well, most of the time, in a few papers, it was actually in the junction between the large and the small intestine where they had best luck. Do muscle disorders seem to run in families? No. Is scalp itching, tingling, hair hurts, allodynia uh, uh, present in pots? Uh, yes, actually, uh, a lot of people have scalp itching without necessarily even having mastocytosis. And it might be that the sensory nerves are irritated, and we see that actually in, in POTS, and we call it allodynia because uh, they're activated by reasons that have nothing to do with the nerves themselves. Uh, what was the name of the medicine you mentioned for your cinephils? Rupatadine, R-U-P-A-T-A-D-I-N-E, Rupatadine. Uh, it sells in Europe by the name of Rupafin, R-U-P-A-F-I-N. And it's also available in syrup for children. Uh, can shredding in lower back and groin area be related to mast cells? Uh, that's, that's kind of very complicated. Uh, you know, it can be dysautonomia. Uh, it can be uh, cancer. Uh, it can be local infection. It can be mast cells. It's impossible to tell without examination and a good history. What can be done to prevent hives and symptoms for pressure or friction? That's another way of having actually hives. Um, uh, this can exist without mastocytosis. It's more common in mastocytosis. Treatment is avoiding, obviously, the pressure or the friction to the extent possible and adding you know, antihistamines and neuroprotec or fibroprotec, sometimes depending what the friction is. I have muscle activation disorder. My foot triggers seem to change. Will the triggers continue to change? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, you have to actually keep the muscles quiet. My five-year-old son has EDS and MCAS. <coughs> he 
He's been diagnosed with PDD NOS, that's pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, in other words, autism, and ADHD. You've got to write to me. His developmental pediatrician wants to start Ritalin unless there's self-injurious uh, um, behavior or the child is all over the place and the attention span is like three minutes. I wouldn't necessarily start with Ritalin first. Uh, if there are any allergies, I'll address the allergy with antihistamine and Neuroprotec. Uh, and if, if the child continues, of course, you might have to use Ritalin, but it depends on the presentation. I've had a low grade fever for seven months, fatigue, other mild symptoms, can this be for mast cells? I will look for cytomegalovirus. That's probably the highest up on my list, or mononucleosis, even though it might not have been you know, full-blown first. What mast cell chemicals are involved in the triggering laxity in ligaments? We don't know that. Um, so uh, we know that certain molecules weaken the ligaments. So for instance, the meat tenderizer tryptase, we know lowers uh, the, the, the ligament, so to the extent that you might have EDS, it might make things worse, but it will not cause, for instance, EDS, which is genetic. What is the government's argument you mentioned? PubMed, P like Peter, U, B like boy, Med, M, Mary, E, E, D, David. PubMed, like pub, public medicine. PubMed.gov for government, G-O-V. Uh, uh, it's very easy to use. It will bring all the abstracts up, and if you see a little book icon, it will bring you the whole publication as well. Uh, I had biopsies for the GI tract and colon. I had too many mast cells in the GI tract and many eosinophils. That sounds like eosinophilic gastroenteritis. I was diagnosed with mast cell activation with these biopsies. Um, okay, I will be wrapping up pretty soon. Uh, and I would, I would suggest that this is eosinophilic gastroenteritis. The drug rupatidine would be very good, and another antihistamine not available in the United States, but many pharmacies will compound it, will help. It's called ketotifen, K-E-T-O-T-I-F-E-N. Uh, daughter has also muscle activation disorder. It's not genetic, but it's very interesting when it appears in the same families. Now, this is an interesting one. Does histamine 3 or histamine 4 allow the cell to become more stable? So, so far we've been dealing with histamine 1 receptors uh, in the skin and histamine 2 receptors in the stomach, now the histamine 3 and 4. It appears that histamine 3 stabilizes the muscles in the brain, histamine 4 stabilizes it everywhere. Uh, so, but on the other hand, histamine 3 receptors are involved in uh, motivation and learning in the brain. So, we don't necessarily want to stabilize uh, those in the brain, but there are no available drugs as of yet for either one of these. We've been hearing more about IV intravenous hydration. Do you think this is beneficial for EDS, MCAT, etc.? I don't have enough experience, but I certainly think it may be helpful uh, for uh, plots or dysautonomia where you have differences in blood pressure, etc. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot of people actually got some good results from that. Hydration by itself is not going to do really very much unless you're very dried up. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily jump into just doing IV hydration. Um, because I cannot, I, I can't understand how it would help uh, MCAS or, or MCAD. Uh, for a diagnosis of MCAS complicated for idiopathic anaphylaxis, uh, would Zoller be a good idea to try? Yes. Zoller, again, is the neutralizer of IG unless you respond negatively to it. Is there a relationship with lupus and mast cells? There are a couple of publications that say so, but I don't have enough uh, to really call it. Uh, vitamin C, beta of the extra, bitter orange, blah, 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 is a good or rather triggering of MCAS. I, I don't know. Vitamin C does not affect the mast cells, but if it's not pure, there might something else from, uh, you know, buckwheat or something else, it might uh, trigger the mast cells. I've been able to eliminate just about all symptoms, blah, 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 by reducing mass, 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 I'm not quite sure what that means, M-E-S-S, and using supplements, et cetera, et cetera. However, I still have a lot of bloating and intestinal inflammation. I want to stop taking Formotin because I've been taking it for five years. Again, uh, you know, the, the drug cyproheptadine or periactin, uh, P-E-R-I-A-C-T-I-N, is very good for gastrointestinal problems. Uh, it's a muscle, uh, mild blocker, and it helps with migraines as well. Do you usually see patients to diagnose them? I've answered that. Uh, I have EDS, MCAS, spots, and other active IgE, I'm sure if it's mast cytosis, I've looked for common 
uh, feelers, etc., etc. How can I get my body to accept medications? It's almost impossible uh, without basically covering, uh, you know, yourself in best way uh, that you can to lower muscle cell activation before you try, uh, you know, any any drugs. Unfortunately, in fact, a group of patients have filed suit against the FDA because, uh, as you know, about 80% of uh, capsules and pills have fillers. Only about 10% are active ingredients, and those fillers contain actually um, uh, lactose, gluten, uh, soy, and other things, and they don't tell us that. And many patients that are intolerant to those foods, they're taking medications, they respond to that. So it might not be the medication, but it might be the fillers and excipients and dyes in them. Are anti-seizure medications activating mast cells? Most of them do not. Uh, my son Caesar stopped after he uh, started Muntelkas. Uh, that might be because he might have an underlying muscle related problems, um, and, and that's why he did better, I think, especially in system and diet, and not necessarily that the drugs uh, trigger the cells. On the other hand, any drug in such patients can trigger the cells. Can children have MCAS without mastocytosis? Yes. I think you said, oops. Uh, how common is bone pain? About 60% of mastocytosis patients have bone pain. I'm down to about 10 questions. Uh, is there a relationship to CPY P450 polymorphism? These are enzymes in the liver that break down all drugs and other molecules. Uh, yes, um, if you have actually such polymorphism or such problems, let's say, you might not be able to metabolize certain drugs. They may build up and they might cause problems. Uh, luteolin is okay. Uh, the question is, how about luteolin? But luteolin and other flavonoids at large doses, about 2,000 milligrams a day, can actually block uh, this CYP450. So if you're already lacking it, uh, you might be blocking it if you're taking other drugs that need to be broken down, they might not be broken down. So you have to watch out if you're taking any other drugs. Is there any relationship to Gilbert syndrome? That's very interesting. I've not seen Gilbert syndrome with mastocytosis, but I've seen Gilbert syndrome actually with autism, and we can, if you're interested, you can talk to me. Any doctors in Montreal, Canada? Not, none that I know of. There is one actually in Setsquatsan, uh, or, or um, I forgot now where. Uh, I, c I can tell you of, it, of at least one if you uh, email me, but they're not in Montreal. Can we include pictures of reactions with our emails? Yes, just please don't overdo it and, and, and overload the system. Just choose one or two that are representative if you email me. You mentioned reaction to beer was bites. What about mosquito bites? Many mastocytosis patients will have actually an enormous mosquito bite. Uh, they might last actually, you know, a day or two, but it will not cause anaphylaxis. So it might not be life-threatening, but it might be a pain in the neck. Uh, taking, again, the antihistamines as well as putting a cortisone right on the spot would help. Again, the general derm cream when it's out will help. Tramadol is good, less side effects than stronger opioids. What about uh, uh, Nusentha? I don't have enough experience with that. Is bone pain common? Yes, it is, and I'm almost to the very bottom. GI biopsy showed over 30 mast cells. I would worry, again, about eosinophilic uh, gastroenteritis or, you know, mastocytosis because you would have, actually, mast cells in an organ other than the skin. Uh, one needs to follow up uh, that. Uh, chromaline seems to be helpful. In that one, uh, Neuroprotect is very helpful, uh, and Periactive would be very helpful. And that's the last question. Hello? Thank you so much. Okay. Dr. I'm sorry I was speaking as fast as I could. Yeah, it was amazing. You're, you're an auctioneer, I think, too. <laughs> So anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm glad people stayed stayed through, and the questions were very appropriate. I have to say, I wish I had more time with most of the questions and many of the people that ask the questions. <laughs> and everyone is very impressed with uh, with the the depth of the detail and expertise you've shared with them. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm uh, grateful to their comments. Scrolling through here on the live attendees, so I we really appreciate all your extra time you spent with us today, and um, we're looking forward to um, you know any additional information you want to provide with the recording. And again, everyone, the recording will be available. Um, in the next 24 hours on the lovely, website. Lovely, lovely. Same link, at, same link that you went same, to. Same, same link. Tonight. Excellent. Uh, may mm -hmm. I actually put the link on my website as well? Yes, okay? please do. Please okay, do super. That. 
And as I said, if anybody really wants to kind of get a feel of how complicated these patients are, uh, please do visit on YouTube my must sell symptoms. Uh, I'm sorry, my mystery symptoms and must sells. I'm sorry, my mystery symptoms and must sells because I also go through quite a bit of what I said today, but not to the same extent. We did much better okay. here. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And we can we can provide um, those links um, along with the recording too. So if Excellent. Those, they Excellent. Can, they can click on them there. Well, okay, I wish everybody a very very lovely evening and good health. Thank you so yep, much. To the extent possible. Best to, best to you with your continued research, and we really appreciate um, thank you. all your compassion right. Good night. for our group. Good night. Okay, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you uh, attending our webinar this evening. A uh, reminder that uh, Hal Dietz will be our presenter on uh, June uh 16th, I believe. 16th? Okay. I wasn't sure if I was coming through. On June 16th. And also, uh, please go out to our uh, our store at bodysupportstore.com. That is what funds this program, these webinars. And uh, we have over 250 products out there. Uh, so check it out. And, and you can also order shirts out there. EDS Awareness shirts are available. We just got a new supply of them in, so we're going to be up to 4X size, small to 4X, so check those out as well. And uh, do your EDS awareness activities, and when you do, uh, report them to us, and we'd like to add them to our list. So, again, uh, thank you for all of you that attended. We went a little over time, but I think it was well worth it. It was incredible that the doctor answered over 110 questions, <laughs> so fabulous. So everyone have a good evening. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.